Yes. Okay. Yep. Good. Uh, my name is uh, Thijs van der Storm. I uh, work at CWI. And um, before I start, I would like to say that on behalf of CWI, we are quite honored to have Peter here this week. And I must say, I'm quite honored that I can present some of the work done at CWI here this very day. So, uh, first, I say something about myself. Well, I, like I said, I work at CWI, I'm a researcher. Uh, there, uh, in a part-time fashion, I also teach at the University of Amsterdam in a master on software engineering. Uh, there I teach software evolution and software construction. Uh, my interests are basically uh, software evolution and uh, version control and uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, on the other hand, programming languages and especially domain-specific languages. Um, today I'm going to talk about a uh, piece of technology that can be used to uh, create or uh, evolve or uh, test uh, domain specific languages. Uh, the title of this talk is therefore using the meta environment for model driven engineering. For it is my opinion that model driven engineering is not just defined by UML based stuff but also includes other approaches. And I hope I will uh, have shown you this after this, uh, these three quarters. Uh, that this is indeed the case. So, <clears throat> what actually is this meta environment? Well, it's a programming environment for languages. Just like you could say that Smalltalk is a programming environment for Smalltalk, this is a programming environment for different kinds of languages. And we will see that this has quite radical uh, effects on how, you, uh, uh, how such an environment uh, comes about. Um, there are basically two halves in the meta environment. There are two meta languages uh, that are called ASF plus SDF. Together they make up the formalisms that can be used to uh, create uh, uh, programming languages. Not just domain specific languages, but any kind of uh, computer languages. The ASF part stands for algebraic specification formalism. This sounds really formal and, uh, and old-fashioned. Well, it's a very old name, but uh, well, that's the way it is. And uh, the second part is SDF, which is the syntax definition formalism. And I will show examples of both formalisms in, in due course. So I, I thought long about how I would introduce this meta environment <laughs> to this small talk audience. And, uh, in the end, I came up with uh, one way of doing it, namely by analogy. So I will now try to uh, explain the meat environment and its concepts in counterpoint to small talk. And I'll start with one of uh, the basic axioms of any small talk system, that everything is an object. Well, we all know that, uh, what that means in this uh, conference. What does this mean in the meat environment? Well, everything is source code. This may sound surprising since, well, in any programming environment you would expect that everything is source code, but here everything means the objects of computation. You compute with source code. So, in fact, it's, that's why it's called the meta environment. There is basically no level below the meta environment. There is only meta program. Uh, source code is parsed, and uh, the result is a parse tree, and we call these things terms just as in algebra you can add uh, uh, one term to another so you can uh, that's one of the algebraic uh, uh, remnants uh, there. So concretely <coughs> I hope that this picture is uh, readable. No. Uh, no? Yeah. <laughs> well it doesn't matter. I mean it's clear that it's a tree, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, okay. So terms are trees and uh, what kind of trees? They are parse trees and not just abstract syntax trees. They are abstract syntax trees that includes all information uh, of the source text, so including comments, white space, and so on. And uh, as an example here, I, I've uh, uh, written down a, a little piece of uh, small talk, and uh, the parse tree you see there is what you get when you parse this uh, uh, piece of small talk using my grammar. So this, a second axiom of small talk is that every object has a class. 
And in the meta environment, since we're dealing with source code, you could say that, well, all source code has syntax, obviously, one would say. Uh, and in the meta environment, one defines the syntax of, uh, of these source codes uh, by defining complex free grammars. Uh, we have an elaborate parsing technology that helps you to define, uh, to use uh, uh, defined grammars in an easy and uh, declarative way. So uh, this is the SDF part, by the way, of uh, the meta environment. Uh, it's similar to EBNF, only uh, the productions are reversed, also in an historic artifact. Uh, it allows fully modular uh, grammar specifications, and that's uh, possible because uh, the formalism supports arbitrary context-free grammars. And arbitrary context-free grammars uh, are closed on the composition, so you can put uh, take two context-free grammars, put them together, and you get, again, a context-free grammar. <coughs> this is not the case for other parsing uh, sub, uh, subclasses. Um, the parsing algorithm uh, to parse these languages is a generalized LR parser, parsing, and it has integrated uh, 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 lexical features, so there is not a separate uh, scanning phase. And because uh, that's one other thing, uh, consequence of supporting arbitrary context-free grammars is that you may uh, write ambiguous grammars. And for that reason, SDF has uh, a number of disambiguation constructs that can be used to prevent these uh, issues. So as an example of SDF, I, I, I don't expect you to uh, completely read this, but you may recognize that this is might be uh, the grammar of uh, small block method declarations or a part. And actually, this is part of the grammar that I used to parse the small block expression in the, pre in the previous slide. Okay, so every object has a class. Uh, uh, that was uh, the previous action of small block. The next action is all computation occurs through messages. Well, we know since this morning that this may not be the case in small block. Uh, in a complete sense, but well, the idea is clear. In the meta environment, uh, it's not an object-oriented system, so uh, uh, computation happens in a different way. And uh, the way uh, we compute uh, with parse trees uh, terms is by <coughs> transformation. So the only thing that you have in uh, the meta environment for computing stuff is transforming source code. Well, this may sound uh, completely nuts and radical, but uh, uh, you will see that you can do a lot of interesting stuff with just this notion. Um, these transformation steps of source trees are specified using rewrite rules. And this is the ASF algebraic specification formalism. You write rewrite rules, they have the left hand side, there's the concrete syntax pattern. Uh, there uh, a parse tree is matched and you return another uh, parse tree. On uh, the left there I have uh, shown some uh, examples, uh, for instance the, the basic algebraic laws that everybody knows like x plus zero is x equals to x, x times one equals to one, etc. So on the left hand side of the equal side you have a piece of source code. On the other hand, uh, on the right hand side of the uh, equal side, you have another piece of source. The other examples show that because we have these arbitrary context free grammars, you can write these rewrite rules from arbitrary languages, not just basic algebraic rewrites. So, for instance, uh, the middle part with the if statement normalizes uh, uh, an if statement with a negation in the condition, and it returns uh, an if statement with the two, uh, and the can clause and the else clause reversed. And uh, the last example shows uh, how you could write a compiler uh, this way. It shows how you could uh, compile uh, a while statement to an imaginary uh, assembly uh, sequence. Um, the, the technology behind this is uh, based on term rewriting, uh, so this means that uh, the, the transformation of a certain uh, source code uh, tree is done by repeatedly applying transformation. Uh, 
Uh, this means that it's purely functional. So there is no state, no side effects, just way like and just flex uh, To make some of, uh, 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 some of our lives uh, uh, a lot easier, there's also support for automatic traversal so that you don't have to uh, uh, hand code the traversal of a large uh, syntax. Which is, by the way, uh, very uh, uh, nice if you have to transform uh, a million lines of code, for instance. For this okay, um, well, the final axiom that I'm using here uh, the language is the environment, the small one. Uh, I think uh, all of you agree that without the environment, without the image, small work can be small work. In the mid environment, it's not so radical, but uh, in a sense, uh, there is uh, a link in the sense that since everything is defined uh, using languages, we also define integration to the environment using languages. So the languages, uh, some of the languages you uh, have defined are contracts to the environment. The environment knows about a certain type of signal. And to show some examples, uh, in the current version we have uh, a language for error messages, a language for text representation, a language for formatting, uh, pretty printing, uh, syntax free, and uh, uh, an example of a screenshot with the error languages is shown. So the, the environment knows, well, okay, this is error syntax, it reads the data structure, the parse tree, and displays it to the user. During the demo, I will show how this works. Uh, it's also easily extended, so you could easily define your own language that you would like to have, int uh, have integrated in the environment. The only thing you have to do is define it using SDF and define a GUI plugin that consumes this, this language. So, what does all this have to do with model driven engineering? Well, what is model-driven engineering anyway? Uh, I think that in the model-driven community uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion in terminology uh, stuff. Uh, some people think that model-driven engineering is uh, equal to stuff with UML, for instance. Uh, other other uh, approaches think, well, BSLs belong there, uh, or don't belong there. Or the models should be graphical, but need not be uh, UML. But I think that, for instance, something like Magritte or Ruby on Rails is also, to a certain extent, model-driven engineering. And the same is happening now at Viewpoints Research Institute, where OMITA is used to uh, define really small domain-specific languages in order to increase the level of abstraction and to uh, be more productive and more intentional. Of course, model-driven engineering includes the stuff that we discussed this morning, like fame and uh, uh, MBA small. Uh, um, if you look at the literature, there seem to be some basic notions in model-driven engineering. One of them is domain-specific uh, notations. They can be graphical or textual, and uh, the fact that they are domain specific means that you can uh, better represent the problem domain and uh, be more productive, uh, have better quality code, or uh, uh, have a better communication with stakeholders, and so on. Um, the second thing in model written engineering that receives a lot of attention is transformation. For instance, code generation or model to model transformation and even basic compilation uh, are, are subjects that are now getting increasing uh, attention from uh, um, This is a picture that's similar to uh, the one that uh, uh, April showed. Uh, and uh, it shows how in model driven engineering you have the system which is modeled by a model and the model conforms to a meter model, and the meter model conforms to a meter meter model, which conforms to itself. Now, uh, if I if I match this to the meter environment, then you get uh, this. We have a system. Well, it's represented by some source code, which conforms to a certain grammar, and the grammar is uh, conforms to the grammar of grammars. 
And now this may uh, sound like a word trick or something, but in the meantime, this is actually so. I mean, our language for defining languages is just one of the languages in the meantime. Okay, um, to show uh, how the data environment uh, uh, works in practice, I will give a demo. And for the demo, I have devised a really small domain specific language, language which can be used to generate mark. Maybe not an interesting domain, but well, it serves uh, pretty well to demonstrate the data environment. This language is called Webric. Uh, here you see some of the inspirations for the language. Uh, if you know them, then the inspiration, uh, you will see the link immediately. Um, this is a simple example. Uh, in Webric, you define functions that produce markup. Um, functions can receive parameters, and they can receive a block, similar to uh, small block or Ruby, only it looks more like Ruby. Um, for instance, in this uh, main function, you have a layout function invocation, and it receives a parameter hello, and it receives a block containing uh, a header definition and a paragraph containing the string hole. The layout function sets up the basic HTML page, HTML tag, head tag, title tag, and the body, which contains a yield statement uh, that will be evaluated with the block passed into the layout function. Uh, many of you uh, will have noticed what this generates. If I run this code, then well, you get something like this. So, in, in itself, completely uninterest, uninteresting, but very nice example. To show that it's not, uh, that it's uh, uh, semantically a non trivial language, uh, you have also this example shows how you define recursive menus uh, where you use an if statement and recursion and, and iteration construct to iterate over certain data and, and that's it. Just to give you an expression on what kind of language this is. So it's actually a real programming language. It's not just isomorphic to HTML. Um, what did we do in the meta environment to implement this? Uh, well. We had some uh, grammars, of course. We had uh, we defined a grammar for rhetoric. We used a grammar for XML uh, to generate the markup. We used a grammar for Java to uh, compile rhetoric programs to Java classes, and uh, some other tooling around it. So, for instance, rhetoric is modular language, so we needed to uh, uh, build a tool to resolve imports. Uh, we also uh, uh, defined uh, the formula <coughs> method so that you wouldn't use wrong tag names or have, have duplicate uh, definitions, uh, and so on. And these were all uh, defined uh, using the meta environment uh, uh, as tools. Okay, so and then I think it's now time for a demo. If there are no questions. I hope this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is the main screen of the meta environment. Um, let me show this first. This is a really large graph uh, containing the import structure of all modules that were used in the implementation of uh, fabric. So both the compiler, the interpreter, the uh, formatter, the checker, the fact extraction, etc. <coughs> These modules in this graph uh, correspond to ASF plus SDF modules. So, below here you have the issues uh, error plane. Here you see messages that well, either put, uh, list errors in your grammars or in your specifications, or errors that you have uh, produced yourself. Uh, here you have a navigation view where you see uh, a directory hierarchy of all your uh, Modules. Basically, this is, uh, represents the same information as this import graph here. So, uh, I showed you this demo program. This is it in complete form. As you see, uh, this is an editor, by the way. <laughs> you can edit it here, and as you see, it's 
uh, it got syntax highlighting. Well, I didn't have to do anything for syntax highlighting because syntax highlighting can be derived from the grammar. And if I write a little comment here, uh, Well, interesting, I, I composed uh, the rhetoric grammar here and the Java grammar here, and both have the same comment convention, so this leads to an ambiguity in this comment. That's why it's bad. But anyway. Um, so the syntax highlighting is derived from the grammar, and you get that for free. And you can customize it, so if you, you say that well, this is a comment, then it should be highlighted like this, and, and, and so on. Um, <coughs> So what, what, what's happened here actually is you edited the term, edited the term, which is text, and it got immediately parsed over my grammar uh, uh, from uh, the little language. That's why I see highlighting. So if it's parsed, it means that the parser is somewhere, and I can show you that it indeed is. So here you see the parse tree of that little snippet of uh, uh, source code that I just showed. And uh, these kind of features are essential if you uh, are dealing with ambiguities and so on to either of your Sorry? Uh, yes, I can show that. It will be a large screen. shows a tree including all layouts and uh, you, know, you see that it contains a lot of information but here you see slowly this diamond shows that there is an ambiguity it can be parsed like this and it can be parsed like that so we do parse forward yes exactly uh, even with cycles, if you write cycling terms. <coughs> um, so this is the parsing part. Um, by the way, if anyone has questions during this demo, please, uh, please ask me. Um, what you also see here is that there is this rubric menu in the in the environment, which is automatically generated if I uh, play by the rules of the environment. So if I have a, uh, a specification in a subdirectory here, from uh, called run, then it will add this menu item for my language and it will invoke uh, the transformation defined in the module in that language. So I can now uh, do run. You see here that uh, I generated the XML uh, corresponding to that snippet uh, rubric, and you also see that it's uh, uh, also highlighted. So it's really a tree-to-tree -tree transformation, and this is only a rendering, namely a rendering produced by unparsing. And to make this a bit more nice, I've also made a, a format for XML. So that you all this is based on ASF plus SD. Um, I, showed, uh, or I showed a slide with uh, the error message of, uh, the, of the invalid XHTML tag. Uh, that was actually a real error that I made in this uh, example once. I made a typo in this function. And then, well, if the function isn't defined, then uh, the interpreter will uh, assume it's an HTML tag. Uh, 
but well, it's still an error, so we want to prevent it, so we made a checker, and uh, because it's a menu, we can run this checker. So, and, uh, I can't break, uh, change the font of this, but so it's new. Here you have it. It also says uh, where the error is, and I can click on it, and the cursor jumps to the offending place and gets a screen uh, too. Uh, well, this is a really simple error, but uh, uh, I hope it's clear that uh, using this uh, language-based integration uh, stuff, we can uh, enhance this environment using uh, a bit uh, IDE features for your own language. Okay. Another thing is that um, <coughs> often you want to have uh, more insight in the semantics or structure of your, uh, uh, of your program, uh, which is not easily uh, represented using uh, parties. <coughs> so this is where fact extraction comes in. Fact extraction is basically uh, collecting information about uh, uh, a piece of source code but representing it in a relational form so that you can query it, enrich it using uh, relation algebraic uh, operations. But not only that, you also want, might want to uh, visualize this code. And that's also one of the other sub-languages interpreted by the meta if you generate these sets of relations, then the meta environment will display them. I opened here the fat pane and the uh, store uh, concept unfolds, where we have a certain sets uh, with information that I've extracted from a library program. So, for instance, I made a basic uh, relation containing statistics on, uh, on web programs. And now here you see that this relation can be visualized as a pie chart or a uh, bar chart or whatever. So for instance, and here, here you have it. And these uh, visualizations are in essence also extensible. So if you write the right, write the right plugin, then you can add your own visualizations, register to, to a certain Set of relation type, and they will be included in the Currently, you can uh, have pie charts and uh, uh, bar charts um, and uh, uh, graphs, for instance, for call graphs. I'll show them here, unfortunately. And uh, another nice thing is that uh, the built in data type, again, a little language, is the language for source origin. So here you see area in file, blah, 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 and I don't know, I can't show it now, but it includes the column number and the line number of a certain element. And this means that you can always trace back certain facts to the actual source code. So if I click here, I jump immediately back to the location where the name was defined. Um, okay. Uh, Showed you before. Not. I think that's uh, about it. For the demo. If there are any questions uh, about the demo or things that you'd like to see, here <coughs> around this one. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is, uh, it looks like an impressive tool. Couldn't you integrate it uh, on an existing platform? Well, actually, our current work in our group is uh, working on integration with the kids. Because, uh, well, we have some IDE features, but we would like to have others too. And if you base your uh, implementation on something like the clips, you get all things, uh, all, all sorts of things for free. For instance, version control, project management, uh, what have you. Also, better integration with Java will be possible. I know this is uh, 
understand your concern that much. So I'm about to that. It's, you know, if you just have transformation, sometimes it, it's nice to have uh, some kind of backdoor or, or, or way to pull uh, arbitrary code uh, outside of the form. You can have them, and it's really easy, but you have, will have to program some integration stuff. Yeah. So, well, in the code of the meet and part. Oh. So, and, and of course, the, the language uh, that, that you will use is just defined in, uh, in uh, the syntax definition. For instance, the language of errors. I can just show uh, the syntax of errors. Uh, checkers return a summary which contains a list of errors and <coughs> errors can be info warning etc. In a similar vein, uh, these other languages Here the, the lines of code that I've used to develop all these uh, rhetoric components. Uh, well, these lines of code don't mean that much in itself, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it shows at least that you can uh, make uh, a comprehensive tool set for a little programming language uh, in a short amount of time. Uh, it took me two weeks, but well, I, I knew the environment, so that's, that's kind of cheating. But, um, uh, so we developed this, the grammar itself, including this ambiguation. We developed an interpreter to prototype within the environment. After that was uh, kind of settled, we developed a, a Java, uh, a compiler to Java, which can be used in you know, arbitrary dynamic context, and circuits or whatever. Um, we developed an import resolver that reads the files and combines them and, and so on. And we uh, developed the checker and uh, the ex effect extraction. Uh, just in, well, say, 5,000 lines of code, and some of them are uh, uh, reused from uh, existing stuff. So, for instance, the Java grammar, which is by the way Java 1.5, uh, is produced by someone else and could just be reused. Since the same holds for the XML. <coughs> Within the model driven engineering paradigm, 
It's not the only thing, but it's one of them. And I've uh, shown this uh, leverage as a case <coughs> to uh, show how the meat environment more or less works. So this ends my presentation. Uh, I think there is time for questions. So <coughs> if you have any. So. Uh, I played with an environment a couple of years ago, three, four years ago. So yes. uh, at that time, I was frustrated. Uh, what was the yeah. stage of the project? Was, at that time, I, I didn't run away, but I, I gave up after a couple of years yeah. because uh, it was, was unreliable. It was <laughs> most of the time. Well, a uh, lot of. Uh, there seem to be have been stability problems uh, three years ago with this meat environment. Well, they, I, I can say that I have no problem with it at all at this moment. A uh, lot of a uh, lot of a uh, lot of uh, stuff has happened. Uh, we have a new GUI. Uh, the tools have been re-implemented really in uh, Java. Uh, it's better than ever before, <laughs> as always. <laughs> Um, how would you compare this to the work that Alessandro Worth is doing on Ometa? Ah, uh, well, the comparison to Ometa is, of course, uh, obvious uh, in a sense. Uh, there, there are a number of differences. Uh, Omita, Omita uses a different parsing formalism. So uh, it's based on parsing expression grammars, which are uh, a restricted class of complex free grammars, which you don't have the risk of ambiguity, which is very good, but you have to write your grammar in an awkward way. Uh, this may be a drawback, uh, uh, the ambiguity may be a drawback for. Uh, SDF when you're developing a DSL, but it's essential for other applications that the meter environment is also useful. For instance, reverse engineering, renovation, and so on, where uh, you have to deal with legacy language that are ambiguous. So you have to deal with it in a sense. Okay. Um, so that's one difference. Uh, the other difference is uh, in Omita is embedded in uh, uh, fuses, uh, parsing actions in a dynamic language. So as you are parsing, you are evaluating about something, small talk, JavaScript, or uh, whatever Omita uh, is based on. And uh, that's something that uh, we don't do, we just rewrite parsing. So that's basically it. But if you look at the applications of Omita, defining little languages for little subdomains, then uh, it's quite similar. Simple. Thanks. And uh, this is my